So in 2012, Gary Bernhardt gave a talk at Code Mash entitled What? Uh, for those who have not seen it before, the focus of this talk was this. Uh, basically, he walks through a few idiosyncrasies of uh, a couple programming languages and uh, JavaScript, which is uh, displayed here, gets uh, kind of a lot of the focus of the attention, somewhat deservingly. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it because it's, it's a very funny and memorable talk. So my uh, coworker Greg de Koenigsberg and I were kicking around ideas for me to talk about here at DotScale, and uh, we kind of thought it would be fun to riff off of this talk, uh, after which he coined the following term, Wattomation. So basically, I'm going to discuss uh, some times that uh, some engineers, some ops teams, some DevOps teams, if that's your thing, uh, were using automation in, shall we say, less than optimal ways. Uh, so before I start, how many people are using automation for everything? And by everything, I mean testing, CI, CD, uh, scaling up, scaling down, backups, failover, recovery. So not, not too many, not too many. Uh, when I mean everything, I mean everything, as Gary Oldman here is showing. Uh, so there's certainly been a, a very big push um, to automate everything, thanks to the DevOps movement. Um, but unfortunately, automation can still cause you problems if you're not careful. Come on. Well, first up, we have this example here from Facebook in uh, 2010. Uh, they had a pretty major outage caused by, of all things, their automation software. It was designed to try and automate resolving problems, but it ultimately ended up just causing bigger problems because it was designed to only deal with transient errors, and what they had was a persistent error. So every system that had this software installed on it started slamming their database and ended up DDoSing their database and causing an outage. So the lesson here is sometimes it's difficult to kind of uh, expect some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, so, one of the biggest causes of outages that we see a lot is network outages. Uh, in this case, Time Warner had an outage in 2014, uh, to which they released the cause was a bad network configuration was propagated automatically across their network. Uh, ultimately, this caused an outage in 29 of the 50 United States, uh, impacting over 11 million customers for a period of time. Uh, this one was a bit closer to home. Um, about a year ago, a gentleman posted something to Stack Exchange uh, in which he claimed that he had wiped out his company accidentally with an Ansible playbook. Uh, it later came out that it was a hoax. He was basically trying to create a viral marketing campaign for a company he was starting up. But the gist of what he was claiming happened was that in this uh, little Ansible snippet right here, he had left these two variables, path and some file, undefined, and had ended up doing a, you know, a recursive delete on every web server in his environment, uh, deleting every file. Now, a lot of people very quickly pointed out this isn't how Ansible works. If you leave those undefined, you'll get an error. However, if it is possible that if you uh, wrote a playbook or a task like this in Ansible and you initialize those variables to empty strings, you might have a very bad day. <laughs> this is, you know, something that actually happens. So I don't think I need to uh, go too much into depth in this one, but uh, Amazon S3 had a major outage earlier this year and the root cause was one of their engineers was running uh, a piece of their automation. Um, they called it a playbook. We're not sure if it was Ansible. But um, it, they basically, uh, the engineer entered a value too large and they ended up removing too many servers from their S3 environment. Uh, their application couldn't cope with that large a loss in redundancy and uh, they ended up having to restart things uh, largely from scratch. Now, unfortunately, they had not done that for some of their services in a long time, so things like the S3 indexing service took a very, very long time to come back up. Uh, automation problems uh, most frequently don't even stem from problems with your automation. It's really a lack of automation. Uh, in this case, Netflix, they had a, a, a slight outage, some problems being caused because Amazon underlying was having issues. And when they determined that Amazon wasn't going to get things back up quickly enough, they decided to move everything out of the availability zone they were in. 
Unfortunately, they had never anticipated needing to do that, so they didn't have any automated processes in place to do so. So they had to do everything by hand. Um, luckily for them in this case, if you read the, the root cause and everything, they managed to do it without having any customer downtime. But anytime you have to resort to doing things manually, you're, there's a very high degree that you're going to forget something, that you're just going to miss something, and there's going to be a large outage because of it. So overall, why do these outages happen despite automation being used? Uh, the reason is complexity. Um, our environments are becoming much more complex. And anytime you have a, a human doing anything, whether it's just kicking off your automation, it can uh, cause problems because humans are fallible. Uh, microservices are becoming very, very popular. In fact, that's how I saw that image uh, tweeted. That's where I first saw it, and I love it. I've sat there for an hour and traced every little guy running around. It's, it's amazing. Um, but even simple, you know, two, three, four tier web applications can have uh, dozens of failure points. Um, so when you're dealing with things like rolling updates, uh, the need to roll things back, if you're doing schema changes on your database, there's a lot of places where you can get tripped up and have problems during uh, your rollouts. Uh, and that tails into the final point there, is that a lot of times we uh, kind of uh, shoot and pray and hope that we don't have problems and we don't really have really good uh, automated rollback and failover and recovery uh, processes in place. We, those are always a lot of times, at least some companies I've worked for in the past, been a very manual process. So another common problem is old hardware. Um, a lot of companies, uh, especially you know, airlines, credit card processing, banks, they have very old systems in their uh, data centers that they still have to interface with because they contain a lot of their business logic and they don't like having to try and rewrite that. Uh, for example, I used to work at a company and we had a mainframe. Uh, I won't say who the company is uh, that was the mainframe was from, but in French, their nickname is uh, Grand Bleu. Um, <laughs> The price tag for the memory on this system was nearly a million American dollars, and this was, you know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, the data storage on that system was approaching a petabyte at that time. Uh, so that's not an easy system to fail over. There's going to be uh, some problems with that uh, regardless. So what can we do? Well, we continue to automate things. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, you know, we can't stop automating things. That way lies madness. Um, automation at least allows us to hopefully prevent mistakes that we've already made in the past. It allows us to make a whole new class of mistakes, which hopefully we can automate around in the future. Also, there are a lot of areas where automation isn't still being used very much. So what is it possible to automate? Um, well, it, Pretty much I've found, at least in terms of Ansible, if it has a remote API or you can talk to it remotely somehow, you can automate it. Um, with Ansible, it's pretty easy to write modules to automate things. It's uh, one of the reasons you know, we've, we've uh, grown to have so many modules to do so many disparate things. One talk I've given I, I, a couple times this year, I gave it in uh, Paris uh, earlier in February this year, was uh, I demonstrate how you can control Philips Hughes lights with Ansible with uh, via modules I've written, or even just raw playbooks using, uh, you know, post and get calls to a, a URL endpoint on their API. If uh, anybody's interested in that, I'll leave this slide up for just a few more seconds so you can get that URL, but all the code and playbooks for doing it are there. But this has really allowed us to take over and uh, really expand into network automation. Uh, not a lot of network automation has been going on over the years, uh, in, like in the case of that Time Warner uh, problem, it was kind of an automated process where they would just maybe copy a config out. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, information sharing with network automation, things like that. It was all very vendor specific. Uh, so if 2016, if you look at most of the major outages that happened, uh, almost all of them were caused by two, these two things. First is a DDoS, which of course there's not a lot you can do against. But the second biggest cause was BGP configuration errors. For those who may not be too familiar with BGP, this is the routing protocol that controls, uh, how it can, uh, manages how different networks on the internet talk to each other. And when that gets misconfigured, it can cause problems very, very quickly. 
Uh, in fact, it doesn't even have to be you that misconfigures it. Somebody else could accidentally configure their routers to say, oh, this is my network too, and your traffic starts going to them on accident. So BGP configuration errors are, are a big problem uh, on the internet at large. Uh, so this is an area, again, just to give Ansible a little plug, that we've, we've seen uh, a lot of traction in. And one of the reasons why is every major network vendor is contributing code to us because they realize what a pain point this is for network uh, administrators to deal with. So another thing we can do is um, when you're building your automation, always try and build safety checks in. Uh, two examples here from some of the outages earlier. Uh, in the first case, how would we have prevented the S3 outage with Ansible? Well, Ansible has a conditional option there, and we just simply say, don't let the number of servers be under some given value. Uh, similarly, with the recursive removal, uh, a simple conditional there would prevent you from doing that. Ansible has a lot of best practices, and uh, a lot of these apply equally to a lot of automation and config management systems. The first is use the built-in systems that your automation provides you, rather than uh, relying on just uh, turning your shell scripts and other things into automation that you run manually. For example, the Ansible module here for the file would safely remove that path and would not recursively remove something. And our module has some safety protections built in to make sure that you don't wipe out your root partition. Another good tip is to uh, make sure you prefix your variables uh, to make sure that you don't have variable collisions. Um, it, instead of using something like port, say Apache underscore HTTP underscore port, that way you know, if you define a port for memcache or something else later on, you don't have a, a variable collision and accidentally use the wrong port for the wrong thing. Last but certainly not least is keep it simple. Um, if you write very complex things, they're difficult to maintain. Uh, I don't think I need to say that too much, but Ansible tries to keep it simple, but you can certainly uh, get under the hood a little bit and do some really complex things with Jinja2 syntax, which is our templating language. Um, we generally try and discourage users from doing that because it makes problems very difficult to track down. Uh, so just as always, keep it simple. So just one last slide to uh, show. Remember, only you can prevent autom automation. So merci beaucoup.